This vessel and its crew are searching the Antarctic seafloor for whatever remains of Antarctica's most captivating shipwreck. Having traveled from South Africa, the vessel has made her way to right here, in the Weddell Sea. From the looks of it, not much of what they're seeking remains. The ship they're looking for wasn't carrying anything precious. And under the Antarctic Treaty, even if they do find anything, they're not even allowed to touch it. But the story behind this ship is so impressive, so revealing of the human will to survive, that finding even what little might remain will be deeply meaningful to anyone who knows. This is the Endurance, locked in by endless miles of Antarctic pack ice. After almost a year on board, 28 men unload their survival essentials and sit helpless on the ice that slowly crushes their ship. The expedition's goal of being the first to cross Antarctica just changed to something now even more ambitious, to get home. With no way to radio for help, the pressure now shifts to this man, Ernest Shackleton. In 1895, the starting gun was fired for the race to the South Pole. The Geographical Congress announced, with reference to the exploration of the Antarctic regions, this is the greatest piece of geographical exploration still to be undertaken. They were like Mars missions. These teams were sailing away with no communication, no hope of being rescued, if anything went wrong, and, and certainly no idea really what, what would be beyond the horizon. Ben has spent more time trekking through polar regions than anyone else alive. The coldest, windiest, driest, and highest altitude continent on Earth. It's a fascinating place. It's a huge place. It's twice the size of Australia, uh, a continent that is the same size as China and India put together. So I wanted his input on what it feels like to actually be in Antarctica under these treacherous conditions. It was like I'd been beamed into the pages of, of this story that had captivated me since I was a kid. The race was in full swing, and attempt after attempt, one stands out. Ernest Henry Shackleton came within 100 miles of the pole, 97 miles away from the title that would secure his place in history, and he had to turn back. He wrote a letter to his wife saying, I thought you'd prefer a live donkey to a, to a dead lion. Then, nearly three years later, Roald Amundsen crossed the Ross ice shelf and became the first human to reach the South Pole. My instinct is, well, you lost. That sucks. But that's exactly why I am not a legendary explorer. That place, Antarctica, and, and those experiences can become sort of addictive, for, for, for want of a better word. So now, rather than throw in the towel, Shackleton came up with an even more ambitious plan. The goal was to cross Antarctica. This is Gerard Baker. I'm an expedition leader in Antarctica and Greenland. He knows everything there is to know about Shackleton's Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. We tend to shorthand it as the Endurance Expedition, but Endurance was just one of the ships. The plan involved the Endurance and the Aurora, two ships that had no way of communicating with one another, starting on opposite sides of the continent. Shackleton and his crew would leave from a whaling station on this small island in the South Atlantic, called South Georgia. Aboard the Endurance, they would cross the Weddell Sea to anchor at Vassal Bay. A portion of them would leave the ship behind and use sledges and dogs to trek to the South Pole. Meanwhile, the Aurora would leave from New Zealand and head for the Ross Ice Shelf. From here, they would work their way toward the South Pole, leaving behind depots of food along the way. So that when Shackleton got to the pole from the north, from the north side, everything is north, when you, but anyway, you understand what I mean. There was food and supplies there, and he could continue crossing. This would supply Shackleton and his men with what they needed to be the first ones to cross the entire Antarctic continent. But if their goal was Vassal Bay, why is this South African vessel searching right here? A couple years ago, I actually got to go to Antarctica and see a lot of the places that Shackleton went, which is a crazy thing to be able to say. I've been going through a lot of the photos from my trip as I've been preparing for this video with the help of today's sponsor, Mylio. Mylio is a photo organization app that helps you access and share your photos much easier. If you're like me, you'll go on a trip 
and come back with hundreds, maybe even thousands of photos from several different cameras, including your phone and maybe even film photos. And with MyLeo, you can sort all of those really easily. You can geotag even your film photos. That's one of maybe my favorite features. When I was in Antarctica, I took one of my film cameras and I took a couple film photos. Using their tool, I could geotag and then easily use either their mapping feature or their calendar feature or even their AI features to quickly find those photos. This tool is really a game changer and it's totally free to download. They do have a paid version where there are some extra tools to help you declutter your photos and to access all of them across all of your devices, across all of your cameras. If you click the link at the top of my description, you can get 25% off their pro plan, MyLeo Photos Plus. Thank you so much to MyLeo for sponsoring this video. And let's get back to seeing how Shackleton's plan went wrong. In the same days that World War I began, so too did Shackleton's Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. Only two days after leaving South Georgia, the crew ran into pack ice. This portion of the journey was familiar to Shackleton and he was prepared for it. For about a month and a half, they worked their way toward Vassal Bay as the ice pack closed in around them. They often would have to cut a path through the ice, or sometimes wait for the ice to break apart. When the expedition came within a day's sailing journey from their destination of Vassal Bay is when they ran into their first major complication. The pack ice became so thick that the ship was fully surrounded with no way out. Initially, Shackleton and his crew thought that they could just wait it out. His experience was that, well, a ship can be frozen and we can we'd be fine. Um, so I don't think he would have been overly concerned. But as days turned into weeks, they set up camp, they watched the sun disappear over the horizon as the dark Antarctic winter set in, and they waited. But as the ship was stuck, the ice was far from still. Pack ice simply floats on the surface. As these massive slabs of ice drift on the water, they can smash into one another and freeze together, while others unpredictably tear apart. For weeks and weeks, they had to just listen helplessly as their ship was groaning and creaking from the immense pressure that this pack ice was piling against her. Using the stars and a sextant, Frank Worsley tracked their position, and this is what he recorded. As the crew waited, they slowly drifted hundreds of miles from the destination they had been so close to. And their goal of crossing the continent now shifted to somehow getting home. This continued for nine months through the Antarctic winter until Shackleton ordered everyone to abandon ship. They grabbed what food essentials they could and the lifeboats. Any lingering hope faded over the following month until their home caved, filled with water, and disappeared below the ice. But remember, this is only half of the expedition. The Aurora was still on the other side of the continent with no way of contacting them. They felt compelled to do everything they could because if they didn't do their job, Shackleton wouldn't survive. He'd get to the pole and there'd be nothing left. Once they watched the Endurance sink, the immediate problem they faced is that they needed to get off the ice. They were using the drifting ice to their advantage because they needed to get back north and all they had were their little lifeboats. It was helping for a while until they began drifting east, away from any land. So Shackleton ordered that they began pulling their lifeboats across the ice to head west as the drift pulled them east. Just think for a second that these are men who have been living in Antarctica for almost a year, have been wearing the same clothes basically the entire time, and have been rationing their food with no idea if they would be saved. This pack ice wasn't just smooth ice that you could easily pull a boat over. It was melting and freezing, and there were huge pressure ridges, and the boats would sink into the ice and then freeze into them, and they'd have to break them out of the ice. Their boots would fill with water, and they were perpetually wet, cold, hungry, and exhausted. Four months after their ship had been crushed, they were able to safely board their lifeboats and escape the Weddell Sea. 
After six grueling and scary days on the water, they made landfall on Elephant Island. It is the bleakest place. There's just something about Elephant Island that's extraordinarily brutal, really. I got to see Elephant Island with my own eyes and see the shore where these men dragged their boats onto the land. It is a gnarly place. It quickly set in that they really had two options, neither of them seemingly great. The first option was that they could stay marooned on Elephant Island and just wait, hoping until or if someone were to miraculously find out that they were there and come save them. And number two, they could make a daring attempt to cross 870 miles of the most treacherous water in the world to get back to South Georgia, the Drake Passage. In a lifeboat. Obviously, this story wouldn't be inspiring if they just surrendered themselves to their situation, sat down, and waited to be rescued on Elephant Island. So Shackleton prepared one of the lifeboats, named the James Caird, and five of his crew members to make the dash to South Georgia. The remaining 22 men would take the other lifeboat, flip it upside down, and make that their home to survive out of for as long as they could until Shackleton could come back for them. Just nine days after landing on South Georgia, most of the crew would watch the James Caird, their leader, and one remaining hope of being rescued disappear on the horizon. I think the hardest part of it, apart from losing the ship, was seeing Shackleton and the other five go off and being left alone. I think most people would just lie down, cry and die these days. It's difficult to overstate how dangerous and how demanding this portion of the journey was. They filled the bottom of the boat with rocks for ballast and they covered the top of the boat. This was good for their safety, but meant that they didn't have a flat place to lay and they didn't have an open space to sit up. Imagine how difficult it would be to do anything. Sleeping, heating up food, eating, breaking the ice off the boat, and not just doing that in this space, but doing that in the conditions of these waters. A week passed, they were running out of water, they were running out of food, their sleeping bags were literally rotting, and Worsley's navigational skills were pushed to the absolute limit. They had only one or two days when they actually could see the sun, and they had to see the sun to get a position. Not only were they and their clothes drenched in water, but so was Worsley's paper-bound books that he was keeping navigational records in. The lives of everyone back at Elephant Island, as well as the men on the boat, were relying on him to navigate over 800 miles to a tiny little island where if they missed, there wouldn't be land for thousands more miles. After 16 days in these conditions, somehow, by some miracle, the men found their way to South Georgia. It was really Worsley, the navigator, that enabled them to cross by means of dead reckoning, mostly. But there was one more major hurdle for these starving, freezing, tired men. They were in King Hakon Bay, and they needed to get back to Stromness Bay. Because of currents and weather, they weren't able to take their boat from the west side to the east side of the island for fear that they wouldn't be able to make their way back to shore. They were going to have to cross South Georgia on foot. The terrain of South Georgia is unforgiving. These mountains are massive and incredibly jagged. With a piece of rope, screws that they had pushed through the bottom of their boots, and an adze that they would use as a pickaxe, three of the men began to work their way across the island. Shackleton had no map. Working off memory, the three men worked their way across glaciers and mountains, and after a 36-hour journey, found their way back to Stromness Bay, where they heard the whistle of the whaling station. That was the first human sound that they had heard other than their own voices for two years since they lost the ship. You just have to think about that. Think <laughs> how, um, uh, how emotional it would have been for them. From there, Shackleton got a proper ship, and it still took him four attempts over the course of three months to cross the exact same water he had just done in the James Caird. But eventually, on August 30th, 1916, almost two years since embarking on the expedition, 
Shackleton returned to Elephant Island to rescue every single crew member. After a month at sea, having thoroughly surveyed the area, and with one day charter left on the vessel, the crew lowered the autonomous submarine one last time. This footage gives me chills. What looks like something that could only ever have ended up being matchsticks at the bottom of the, uh, the Weddell Sea actually sank and is in incredibly good shape. For me, it's a reminder that maybe when your hope is at its lowest, and maybe when you think there might be nothing left, the power to endure can be far greater than you can imagine. The men may have made it back alive, but they didn't have it easy when they returned. Some of them lost their homes in the war while they were gone. Others came home to their girlfriends married, thinking that they had died. And one, Charles Green, had an especially difficult time. His house was bombed out nine times in the war, the Second World War. He lost nine homes, ended up living in a hospital ward. Having gone through all of the injuries, <laughs> sorry, having gone through surviving the endurance and then the First World War, you know, coming back to the UK, losing all of the, what he had and then still having the, the mental strength to um, survive. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. I've been wanting to make this video for a long time and there's a couple things that didn't make it into the story that I just want to point out. The Aurora is another half of the expedition. 28 survived from the Endurance. Not everyone survived from the Aurora. Three of them died, sadly. The Ross Sea Party arrived at Ross Island in a storm. They hadn't offloaded all the supplies. The anchor breaks ship gets blown out to sea. So these guys are stuck there with half the supplies they'd anticipated. Despite the fact they didn't have 90% of their supplies and the ship had gone, they did their job. Macintosh, um, who was the leader of the, that southern party, was lost in the sea ice and he had the expedition records with him. Shackleton, the leader that brought his whole team back alive, like, it's not, it's not quite the case. But it, having said that, doesn't diminish my admiration and like sense of awe at what he achieved. There were clearly flaws in Shackleton's character. He was also clearly a great leader. Whether he was good at logistics is another thing, which is probably why the Aurora party suffered so much. And unfortunately, only a couple of years after this expedition, Shackleton died of a heart attack, but he was buried in South Georgia. And while I was there, I got to go see his grave, which was really, really cool. As always, I'll put some links in the description to Ben's TED Talk and to a couple resources. Also, uh, the book that I read that got me interested in this initially is called Endurance. I'll link it below. Cannot recommend it enough. Please go read it. Thanks for watching. Peace.